Uh, very pleased to, to welcome Dr. Dan Tingley to present for us today. Dan has worked in the wood products industry for well over 40 years and is founder and senior engineer and wood technologist of Wood Research and Development Limited. He has a Bachelor of Science in Forest Engineering and a Master of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of New Brunswick. And he completed his PhD at Oregon State University in Wood Science Technology and Civil Engineering. Um, Dan is a licensed engineer in many states and provinces in Canada, the USA, and Australia, and holds over 40 published patents, patents worldwide in the field of wood and high-strength fiber composites, including the award-winning FIRP panel fiber reinforcement technology. He has written over 150 conference and journal publications and posts frequently on social media using the catch line, Go Timber. Wood Research and Development has offices in Canada and the USA and Australia and provides timber inspections, structural engineering and design services and has its own IAS accredited testing and certification labs and also runs timber courses. Dan's presentation today will focus on the extraordinary Hangar B of the Tillamook Air Museum in Oregon, USA. Built in 1942, the Tillamook Hangar is one of the largest standing timber buildings in the world, and Dan will discuss its history and construction methods and the non-destructive investigation techniques his company recently used to survey the hangar's condition and inform future repairs. From the early days of his career, Dan's passion has been restoring old timber structures. And one of his favorite phrases is, just because it's old does not mean it isn't any good. So it's over to you, Dan. Go, Dan. Thanks, Doug. Really great. Thanks for that introduction and uh, appreciate being with you to folks today. And I welcome uh, everyone on the line here, ladies and gentlemen. And it's good to be with you again. Uh, it's been a little while since I visited with you. And it's always great to be online with uh, folks of like mind. Um, I, uh, as Doug mentioned, I've been known for being an outspoken uh, a proponent of timber and something that I'm not going to be embarrassed about because I believe that it's a critical aspect of today's infrastructure. And uh, just a little bit of a quip for you. I can remember back in my early design days, I designed a dome in uh, New Brunswick. It was called Bell Dome. And it was for coal storage, and it was 535 foot clear span and 12 stories high, and it had a glue lamp Varex hub situation and uh, just a solid sawn deck that was on top of it. And back in the day, we didn't know what mass timber was. <laughs> uh, we never said mass timber. And I think of that oftentimes as I hear today so many folks talking about mass timber. It's caught fire, literally. Uh, a bad word, but I always use fire and wood together because wood in large dimension sizes gives you better uh, longevity in a fire scenario than concrete and steel. And so I, I, uh, I often think of it because here comes the Tillamook uh, Air Museum, which was Hangar B back in the day in 1943. And, and here's a building that's, uh, you know, over a thousand feet long, uh, 1072 close to 300 wide and nearly 17 stories high and built in 1943, saved 2,000 tons of steel, 2,000 tons of steel, took three and a half railway train loads of wood, 2 million board foot, had a net carbon advantage of 5,800 metric tons, saved almost 1,800 metric tons of carbon going in the air, uh, sorry, 3,800 metric tons of carbon going in the air because of the absence of having to make steel. And this building, of course, made with all the wood they could find because at the time they needed steel for other things in the war effort. And, and they weren't thinking back there about carbon friendliness. Listen, at a time in Canada, I'm here in Canada today at uh, my summer home up in eastern Canada. At a time in Canada when you can't even buy a plastic straw, when they're taxing the Canadian citizens for upwards of 20 cents a liter for carbon, 
I, you know, I mean, if you've ever had a McDonald's milkshake and tried to suck it up through a paper straw, you know what I mean. If it's in there more than five minutes, it collapses on you and you can't suck anything through it. And so at a time when you can't buy a plastic straw or getting taxed for carbon, wouldn't it behoove us all to be thinking about the embodied carbon in all of our old timber structures, the carbon savings and building with new timber structures? And when we look back at these old structures in 1943, isn't it a great thing to, thing to think about all the embodied carbon that's in it? So for me, you know, it's a great renaissance because I started my career in the 70s. And, uh, you know, we worked through the great panacea of concrete for decades. And today it's like all of a sudden there's a wake up call and everybody is saying, hey, this is a great idea. Let's build with wood. And I'm saying it's a great idea. Let's build with wood and let's save all the old wood stuff we got out in the marketplace. Let's save it. I designed a bridge I won a lot of awards for in Eastern Canada. And in that bridge, I used all the old timber piles. And by the time that tim those timber piles are got done their service for this next 100 years, they'll have embodied carbon for 400 years. I mean, that's the way to think about building. So that's kind of my introduction today as I get into the Tillamook Air Museum because it's kind of where we're going. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, here's the outline of today's talk. It's a kind of a little background about us. Doug's done a great job, so I won't spend too much time there. A little introduction to wood science that's relevant to this job. We'll talk about the, the Tillamook hangar as it now exists. We'll look at the inspection and findings. You'll really be interested in these slides because it was an amazing um, uh, building to inspect. And we'll take a look at the future of the hangar. You know, our team uh, has made up of a lot of great people, architects, engineers, CAD people, inspectors in the field. And we're all got a similar passion, and that is to, to save old timber structures and to build with new ones. And uh, we're an interesting group because we combine the test side with an IES accredited test lab and third party uh, lab together with commercial design. And what we do is we go out and find and understand things that are in timber. I often say the timber, uh, in, or sorry, the engineers are trying to assess an old timber building or an old timber bridge. And I say, well, how do you know how to assess its current capacity? It could be 100, 200 years old, 300 years old, when you don't even know the species of it. So a big part of what we do is identify species, then identify grade, and then identify any degradation through fungal growth. 82% of all degradation is fungal. So we, we look at those things and understand things from a lab point of view, from a design point of view, assess current code requirements for demand, assess current resistance requirements, or sorry, resistance capabilities, compare the two, develop utilization ratios, and that's how we reestablish the occupancies for these timber structures. And so that testing background is critical to that. And of course, as um, Doug's talked about, you know, we, we're big into the whole business of wood science and material behavior and understanding that and then teaching others about it. I mean, I don't know about you folks on the line, but I came through in the, the late 60s, 70s, when, you know, it was pretty easy to get a timber course. You could take timber courses if you wanted in design and wood science and technology. But if you graduated in the last 30 years, three decades, you're going to have found it pretty hard at the undergraduate level to get timber wood technology and timber design. And so we teach 16 accredited courses in this whole area in inspection, restoration, maintenance, and design. And we do a lot of it around the world, teaching people how do you understand the capacity of an existing timber structure? What's involved in knowing what it'll carry? I mean, there's no grade stamps in most of these old timber buildings. You do well to see a broad axe mark. I mean, it's the, today we have to understand that species and understand that grade and being an accredited lab is a pretty important aspect of that, where we can have test facilities, big test facilities, little test facilities, and get where we're going in terms of understanding the product that we're dealing with. And so this timber structural inspection becomes a pretty important game. It's rife with liability. If you're paying for E and O, you'll know what I mean when I say about that. I mean, our job is to look at old timber buildings and bridges and our E and O providers are always interested in knowing, well, just how old are they? And what are you doing? Because if things go wrong, right? 
So E and O becomes a pretty important aspect of dealing with these old buildings. You see that lower right hand picture. You know, that's the tallest boom available in the United States. That's what it took to get up there. And we still couldn't reach the top of it. We had to get out and traverse it. And yet to be done is to up underneath the cupola, which is going to take rope access people to move in and around this upper cavity to check it out. And when the maximum dimension of any element is three inches, nominal three inches, it's made with three and a half uh, rail car loads of wood, two million board feet. You can tell what's going on in there. That's a lot of little pieces to look at. And what if you attach your hanging rope to a piece that isn't in such great condition? So it's a it's not a job for the weak of heart, and it takes a lot of specialized equipment, you know, like cyclometers and true compression wave testers and pulse echo testers, resistographs. There's a there's probably five or six key non-destructive test methods we use to understand what's going on in a piece of timber, from you know a, a moisture content meter on through to the blue to the blue box you see in the left here where they're actually measuring the wave speed across that gap because uh, that's where they have a chance to actually look at a broken girder and say well I wonder what that strip what wave speed is across there for understanding this density and you know and what about these wagner moisture meters i mean it, you go buy a, a moisture meter at the local hardware store and did anybody tell you it maxes at 32 you know, the, only the unique meters read over 32. Well, so all of a sudden you're de dealing with wet wood with 50% moisture content. It's pretty important for you to know that your meter only went to 32. Or uh, as you can see here, a resistor drill or resistor graph going on the right-hand side. And so these wood pieces are get pretty important because fungal colonies can have fruiting bodies in the middle and they can be solid. We all look for cavities. We say we hit it if it sounds like a watermelon sounding it. And, you know, it's got a cavity. Well, wait now. Not all decayed wood has got cavities. This particular girder on the right lower fell out. And he looked like that picture on the top left. And that was its time across the piece, 6,784 microseconds on that uh, basically 600 millimeter gauge length. And, and we know cavities started around 2,200. Well, in that particular piece of wood, there was no cavity at the time was high. This is another one here where we can see across the gap and it's about 400 millimeters across and you can see this time, 3,414 microseconds. So understanding these aspects of measuring timbers capacities is pretty critical. Uh, if I got a pile and I, I'm used to drilling a hole in it, sticking a feeler gauge in and measuring the annulus thickness uh, and not even going all the way through I might not get a true representation. What if the cavity in the pile is over on one side? I'd have to be clairvoyant to know where to drill that pile. If I was using the old techniques, using non-destructive testing techniques, we can take different points on the clock, 12 and six, 10 and four, two and eight, and find the bad actor before he finds us and does this to us. This is what happens with a lack of understanding on the left here. The, the, the pile on the right top here had a big cavity, they drilled a hole into it, found a two, 125 millimeter annulus, didn't realize on the other side, the annulus was 12 millimeters, certified it for triple T precast concrete, and the first heavy across it did, the, did that to the pile, you can see there in the middle. So we don't wanna miss the mark when we're inspecting things, and so understanding these things is pretty important. What if we are into measuring the length of stuff or the depth of a pile? And, and, and no one's ever taught you in school that if I went out to a pile, for example, and it had XII on it or XXV, that was the depth shield. And the old guys driving the piles, you put that on there so whoever followed them knew how far it was to the tip. How would I rate that pile if I didn't know the depth of embedment and the species and grade? Well, you wouldn't. I'd have to combine geo with the depth, with the species grade, and properly rate something. And so... You know, you don't know how to do that, so you can use a pulse echo test device and get the the proper depth of penetration. And you have to use the proper speed, wave speeds and specific gravity and so on. If you're using the wrong ones for concrete, you're going to get bogus data. So understanding these, these parts of the program, like moisture meter limitations, being able to take assay samples. If I'm going to drill a hole in something now, I take an assay sample. I take the outer, inner, inner, outer, as you can see in these bags. And I check the specific gravity and moisture content throughout the width of the piece 
And I do it on purpose because sometimes they're hotter inside, higher moisture content than they are outside. And then I take an ASTM standard method to determine the specific gravity. As you see that table on the right and identify the specific gravity, identify fungal colonies, identify the type of fungus and identify the species. And I combine that with uh, micros microscopy and I detect minute structures and come up with my species. So these are the aspects of in understanding timber that are critical and not just uh, to blow my own horn, but to, to talk about the fact that a jury appears in our field have kind of looked at the things we've done, found them to be novel. And, and we were fortunate enough to be able to win the Ivan Penka award in 96 and the Nova award in 97. It's the first time I ever won by the same proponent, uh, both of those awards. First time Canadians won them. And so, you know, I'm, I'm pleased about that because it helps us understand that wood is to come back into vogue again. And this idea of understanding wood science and the proper care and feeding of a wood structure is pretty important to us. Wood has natural properties that are different from steel and concrete. It's, it's, it's not homogeneous. It's, it's not isotropic, meaning the same strength in all directions. It's anisotropic, different strength in different directions. Why? Because it has a cellular structure that tends to be orientated in a longitudinal direction. And because of that cellular structure, it tends to have different hygroscopicity, that means breathing in and out water. It doesn't change much dimension longitudinally, but it changes a bunch uh, tangentially and radially. And so if you don't understand that and you're a structural engineer, you can get in trouble designing with your bridges or checking out the designs for an existing building because you need to know those features about wood. And wood deterioration, what causes wood to deteriorate? This is no, uh, North America. I have them for in different countries and different continents all over. And, and this is a decay hazard zone. It follows rain exposure. Well, you know, I make my base in Jacksonville, Florida, down here close to the peninsula. And today I'm up in eastern Canada. And different parts of the country and parts of North America have different decay hazard days. If I'm in the prairies in northern Saskatchewan and I'm dealing with an old historical church structure, that church structure has a lot better fighting chance of surviving than it does down in Miami in the Keys where it's got a much higher decay hazard day with all the humidity, the temperature, and so on. And so I, if I understand that, it helps me assess that building in a different light, particularly if it's not conditioned space anymore that it's holding. And so there are three different features about decay that are important. One is temperature, 5 to 35. Moisture is the other one, going to be over 22%, and oxygen over 21 well, guess what? It's pretty hard to deal with the oxygen and temperature. The structures are outdoors, they're not conditioned, uh, or they're big like the aircraft hangar, or sorry, the Tillamook uh, blimp hangar. And then you really not conditioned space, and so the wood is kind of open to the environment. What's the thing we do the best job in controlling, and that's moisture. You know, we hear these expressions all the time about terms called dry rot. Well, dry rot's a misdemeanor. There's no such thing as dry rot. You can't have dry and rot. It's, a, it's either over 22%, 23, 24, at which point if it's not protected through preservatives, fumigants, diffusers, if it's not protected, guess what? It's going to decay. And so our job as designers and planners and historical site visitors is to ensure that the wood that we're looking to protect is staying below that moisture content. Well, here's a little, little bit of senseless trivia. In North America today, for example, in outdoor structures, the average moisture content in an open outdoor structure, that means something that's open deck to the weather, the average moisture content, if it's not touching ground, is 16.4%. The average in a closed structure is 14.2%. Both of those moisture contents are less than 22 but yet Fungal decay accounts for 82% of all timber structure degradation. I'll say it again, 82%. Why is it then that it's counting for this kind of degradation? It's because of the connectors. And the connectors are the areas that get our timber structures because the steel sweats every day. It creates moisture for the surrounding wood. We let leaking roofs go by. We let moisture get in there. And soon we're in trouble. And these fungal colonies kind of all have the same way of growing. they got a spore, they're floating around. If you go over to the local hardware store and you buy yourself a nice brand new two by six or something that smells beautiful wood and you say, oh, I got a brand new and there's no decay on it. Well, on that piece of wood is spores. You can't see them. 
And when you leave that wood in the right spot, guess what? Decay happens. And that, because the moisture content gets up, you have the right temperature, you right oxygen, and here comes the spores growing on hyphae. There's a foot on the end of it. It secretes an enzyme. It's acidic. It breaks down the wood fiber, and the fungal colony proceeds. And we just don't like that breakdown. It's the cycle of life. We just want to intersect that so that it doesn't provide a cycle of life degradation on our timber structures. As you can see there with a the hyphae growing on the right-hand side. And what we do often with the newest form of protection is use a salt rods to neutralize that pH wave. And that's a nifty way of using something very low toxicity to humans to protect timber structures. So you can see examples of what I'm getting at here with this carry log dug out of Western Australia close to Perth, nearly 50,000 years old. It's not a particularly robust wood species for natural durability against decay. The guy standing on it, it's as sound as the day it fell over and got covered over. What was missing? Oxygen. That fellow's in the water with the alligators down in the bayous. He's going after a southern yellow pine log. He's not in there with that alligators for any no reason. He wants that log to saw up into pine flooring. And the reason it's still good as gold, even though it's been a deadhead for 50 years, is because there's no oxygen. And look at this, Pharaoh's tomb, 3,000 years old. All the artifacts are wood. The artifacts are wooden. Why are they still there completely intact? What was missing? Moisture. And what about this one? The HMS investigator, he's caught locked up in the ice trying to find a way around to China, northern Canada. He gets locked in the ice, the temperature drops, and he's as good as the skeletons are underneath the bed clothes. The wood and the timbers are all completely preserved. Why? Because the temperature was low. So wood and water is a pretty important thing to consider as I look at how I'm going to inspect the Tillema uh, air, uh, Hangar B because understanding that relationship is the key to understanding longevity and understanding where the decay could come. The strength properties improve as you, the wood gets drier. The lowest specific gravity value is called the basic specific gravity value. It occurs at fiber saturation point. That's the point where the fibers of the cell walls are saturated with water and water begins to occupy the lumens. That's the basic specific gravity. As you dry wood, that specific gravity increases. And if you look at the codes around the world from CSI to CSA to ASTO to 5100 to Euro, they all kind of look at wood in a kind of a different way. They see it with different moisture contents and that determines how we are going to inspect it and look at it with regard to understanding its ability to resist the current demand loads that are being uh, uh, applied to the structure. So when we look at these structures and we're and looking at old ones, can kind of flat, uh, reflecting back on how decay happens, what criteria has got to be for it to occur, how connectors are playing part of the role in degradation, how they should be included and installed. You know, like a, a lot of people think, well, I put a bolt and nut and washer on a piece of wood that's green. I'm just going to torque it up until I impress the washer into the wood for good, because then I won't have to go back and retighten it when it dries out. Well, that doesn't work. And that compressed wood goes by its yield point and it's still loose after two years. When I went to school, no one ever taught me how much torque was enough for a nut and bolt. It's 25 foot pounds to 35 finger tight and stuck. You should burr the threads, keep three to five beyond the nut, or you can epoxy it and tight it. The second thing is you can install a leg screw without a torque. Never, no one ever told me that there is required torque in a leg screw. You can't install a leg screw without a torque. You turn it into a drill bit. And what was the right size for a pilot hole for a leg screw? And what's the depth of the pilot hole? These are all pretty critical things. Why am I thinking about those? Because when I'm expecting an old timber structure, how it went together in those sorts of terms is in part of understanding its value. And if this old building, you know, nearly 150 years old is sitting in an arid prairie town, uh, that building might have a better time of making the difference and getting down the road, even though he's not painted and the roof started to leak because he's in a very arid climate and that moisture related decay isn't occurring. So because of wood's anisotropic mechanical property variations and because of this difference in the way it shrinks and expands when it picks up moisture, these understanding features are important for us as we look at things like bound water and free water and how much moisture content is in the, in the wood. Well, you noticed earlier, I talked about that moisture meter Wagner if you didn't realize that the moisture meter only reads up to 32% moisture, 
and moisture really plays a big role in understanding what timber's characteristics are, that would be a pretty serious mistake if wood and water was a big part of the program. Or if you built a log church in the Ukraine and it's 500 years old and you're coming back in like Yuri to try and understand its value because there's 500 year old frescoes painted on the inside of that log wall and we're worried about losing them because decay has gotten into the logs. How are we gonna understand what to do with those logs if you don't understand that if you turn a piece of wood sideways and put it in a log, in a log wall, it's going to have a whole lot different shrinkage characteristics than it was if it was standing up and down. So this understanding of shrinkage characteristics becomes pretty important. Now let's talk a bit about preservatives because it leads the way into this uh, refinement of our inspection today and our talk on it. You know, they, the, the three different ways that we protect wood if we want to add preservatives. But I might point out something, the very famous test program that went on on Treat Island off the coast of New York, and where they took two pieces of timber, one treated, one untreated, and they put them up on sawhorses and drove a vertical spike in both of them and tested how long they lasted. You know that the one that was treated didn't last a minute longer than the one that wasn't. You see, the connector let the water into the center core zone where there was no de prevention of decay through treatment because the treatment didn't penetrate far enough and we didn't see the uh, extension of life. But one of the things that treatments do is create, make sure that the wood is inedible. And if you put a pressure treatment on something or a coating on something that's able to do the job, you can get that type of preservative action in your element. Uh, and there's lots of different treatments that you can use today. As you can see here, DOIC all the way down to CA. Lots of them are changing. CCA is kind of on its way out now. Penta won't be made anymore after October this year. Uh, creosote is being kind of uh, kicked out around different parts of the world after Rotterdam. And so we're seeing new treatments like oil-based copper naphthenate. And I say oil-based for a reason because if you've got a dry piece of wood, most codes don't allow you to treat it with a water-based treatment. They call for a treatment with oil-borne treatment so that you can pre-machine, pre-assemble, and post-treat without changing the dimension of the piece. But a lot of people still buy that water-based treated wood because it looks good, they feel good about it, and then they drill a bunch of holes and wonder why it would only last 10 years uh, because they don't understand that exposing the bright wood creates a problem for that long, uh, longevity of wood. So these are examples of different treatments. You can see the workhorses in here right now, these kind of over the years, the decades, these have been the workhorses and copper naphthenate is kind of rising to the top right now as creosote and pentachlorophenol kind of go away. So this is about preservatives like creosote, like pentachlorophenol and issues relating to toxicity. As you can see here, examples of bridges and different treatments. And one of the other factors that we must always consider is that different species have different characteristics with regard to treatments. Some species like inland dug fir is not treatable because its pits are aspirated, they're flattened out, the diaphragms aren't open, and you can't get treatment side grain through it because of it. Coastal dug fir, the pits are not aspirated, they're open, and that's why you always use coastal as a highly treatable uh, dug fir species. And when you do, you get these types of treatment characteristics uh, for penta, like uh, next to a termite, termite colony here after three years, it's still going. Copper naphthenate, similar, not quite as robust and durable as, as Penta, but still a good substitute for it. And then, of course, the field treatments that come along after these things that are applicable to these brownfield sites, are not only the preservatives that make the wood inedible, but fumigants that might kill the fungal colony and diffusers, which neutralize the pH wave of what's my favorite is the use of diffusers. So all of this is kind of a lead up into the business of talking about the Tillamook Air Museum and where did this uh, huge kind of iconic structure come from and what's its genesis and what did we actually do uh, so far to this building? Well, clearly as you look at the picture, you can see why they retained our group to win and inspect it. Uh, it's in bad state of repair in many of its areas. Uh, it's uh, top roof, as you can see here down the top spline at the cupola, that roof needs to be replaced, replaced badly, badly. The slope is low there, the water's laying lots of times, and then they did another very uh, unfortunate thing. Instead of leaving the louvers open on the cupola, which are there for a reason to let ventilation take place, someone found out that the wind was blowing the rain in, and so they closed all the boat louvers off in the cupola. 
When they did that, there was nowhere for the air to ventilate and the top portions of the roof, which were getting leaked on, stayed saturated. Uh, just the opposite of what should have happened, they did and created some consternation. And you can see here in the door uh, sliding chamber in the front end, a lot of that roof system is peeled off. And so those doors on this particular case are hard to operate because there's a problem. So looking back at the history, Hangar B, as Doug said, you know, built in 42, 43, was uh, kind of um, put into action around 1943. It was decommissioned in 1948. It housed eight of these blimps that were, uh, you know, the part of the ZP-33 uh, squadron. There was eight of them that worked out of this uh, building that could all be parked at one time in there. Uh, the building, of course, uh, uh, these blimps were pretty big at 252 feet long, 80 feet in diameter. They held 425,000 cubic feet of helium, uh, lighter than air. They flowed in. They had a great range, 2,000 miles. They could stay up there for three days. They could move along it at 50 to 67 knots. And they could cover about 13,000 square miles of sea a day looking for Japanese submarines. And I always think about this because, you know, um, when we talk about, about America, but when America gets mobilized to, to deal with an issue and you get the country all with one purpose, and that's to defend itself and uh, against the Japanese in this particular case after Pearl, uh, you can tell you what they can do because these buildings were built in roughly 27 work days. I mean, can you imagine today somebody talking about building a building that's a thousand feet long, 300 feet wide, 15 stories high, and you're going to do it in 27 work days? Crazy. I mean, it's an amazing feat what they were able to do. And they couldn't use the steel. They had to go for the war effort. So the biggest piece in minimum dimension in this structure is like nominal three inches. Uh, so this construction of this hangar was kind of unique in that they started from one end to the other. They worked with cranes that kind of moved along two tracks. And, uh, of course, they had a, they were on a time constraint. They had the first uh, blimp arrive, and they didn't have the building done, and it got torn up in a windstorm. And so they really were under pressure to get this building up there, as you can see, in these huge doors. This door is the total weight of each door system on each end was around 120 to 180 tons, I guess. And they slide it in a box. There was a hanging tension cable. And each of these panels, there were six of them, weighed 30 tons. And they had to slide these open in order to get the blimps to sail in. So you can see here just a bit of specification. Well, if you look at this number right here, you're going to find some interesting things. This 3.0 million board feet uh, has the ability about to provide for a carbon sequestration through its growth and then a carbon embodiment differential between that and the carbon created of steel of around 6,800 metric tons. That's a huge carbon benefit. And while that building is still there, it's sequestering carbon. It's just one of the key reasons today that we like to talk about these old timber structures getting saved, continue to sequester the carbon. A big feature in terms of uh, keeping a building going. As you can see here, decking the system after the trusses were up, uh, quite a program, as you can see, these two cranes here. They had interesting systems, and one on the right should show you. They, the cranes were counterweighted in the middle and at the end. So each crane was left in with a counterweight that worked off the pivot at the rear end and a counterweight that worked between them so that they could pivot sideways without falling over and lift these structures. <clears throat> quite an achievement as you think about in fact, that this is in the 40s, and it's not current day. And it's quite an achievement, as you can see here, lifting these pieces into place, starting with a kind of a flat field and getting it done in a record of 27 days is quite a, an achievement, as you can see. You're looking at the height here and all of these single members. I tell you, you walk up to the catwalk, and I've been up to the catwalk, and it's not a game for the weak of heart because you're crawling up between these trusses on with a board ladder system where you look straight down between the rungs, straight down to the floor. Uh, when you get up about 15 stories, that's quite a little look uh, as you think about it. You see the boys putting the roofing on. This is the hangar B with the eight blimps in at one time. You show them they got their stationary towers there that control them. And another Christ, big benefit is that wood doesn't have a near the issue with lightning and static spark arrest issues are not nearly as prevalent 
which is a good thing to have around helium. Um, so this is kind of post-construction. You can see in use as the Navy's moving these structures on wheels and they keep them tethered and move them with the tether pole and uh, kind of float them in and out like one great big balloon. And of course, uh, during this time, it also served as a housing for a lot of the amphibious uh, vehicles and float planes and so on that was in the Navy. It was, uh, it was quite a huge structure to be able to take advantage of all of these aspects. And this is the present day look at the Air Museum. You can see here some of the big uh, structures that are outside the museum. Uh, it uh, needs repair, as you can see by the roof system here. Uh, the metal roof system can go down the road another uh, probably five years, but the top cupola system needs to be replaced. That's one of the first things up for this big uh, kind of facelift that it's going to take. The cost of just leveling this and taking it away is $17 million. So, so the, if you, that brings you to the scope of it, when you think of the size of a building that it takes $17 million to take it down. So uh, for a lot less than that, around 9.8, they can restore it. Uh, for another 2 to $3 million, they can replace its roofing system, and they can put it back in service. So no-brainer that when we finished our assessment, it was about saving the bridge. And then one of the most expensive aspects of, uh, sorry, not bridge, saving this building. One of the most expensive aspects of this, of course, is this big cable system in here that provides the support in the two towers uh, to uh, retract the doors and open them each day. You can take a look at the interior here. Uh, as I said earlier, not a game for the weak of heart. You can see these stairs that go up here in between these trusses, and I have been up to the first catwalk. That's as far as I'm going. Thank you. Uh, some of our other engineers are rope access people. They're mountain climbers, and they enjoyed the time. Uh, but I, did, I wouldn't have enjoyed it, so I was not the least bit interested in doing it. But I was interested in the wood side of it, as you can see here. Um, and, of course, today it's still housing a lot of these old fighter jets and, and airplanes, Second World War era, and Navy planes and so on. You just get a size and scope of it. You look up from the bottom straight up from beside the door. This is one of the doors on the north end and look up in there. When people were up in there working, they look like midgets. Uh, They're so far up in the air. Uh, quite an amazing building when you're in it. If you haven't been to this building, you should plan a vacation and go and get in it. If, when you get in it, you'll just stand back and say, well, what is this? I mean, like this is a whole great big area under a roof. And it's a timber roof. Man, you've just got to get there to see it to believe it. With all these great planes stored in there, too, is a great byproduct to be able to get in there to see them. So the significance of these buildings, which uh, kind of leads me into the results of our testing, is that firstly, these buildings that are recommissioned to the public once they've been commissioned for the military, they, they kind of start <clears throat> out in their military bases. But they also serve a great purpose to the community by providing places for museums. They, one of the hangars provided a space for storage of hay, uh, for storage of vehicles, for storing wood, for drying wood. I mean, we get a building that big and tall, it has a lot of great uses that come to bear. And so the community got used to using these buildings over the decades, and that's a big part of the commerce side. <clears throat> the culture is another big part of it. It's that area, the Tillamook, Oregon, the area's culture had a lot of its identity around this hangar. And they, in the community, they still embrace it. It's considered one of the crown jewels of the town. And, of course, this is a big part of they build their tourism around. And then from the engineering side, I mean, it's, it's an engineering wonder. It's one of the top construction wonders in the United States today. Um, <clears throat> and that's quite a feature for the locals. The, uh, the people that have the job of looking after this, the, um, uh, the Tillamook um, Association, Historical Association, and the uh, port, these people, uh, of course, didn't have a clue what to think about this building. Uh, when the doors were in poor repair and the corridors for the cables that carried the doors were in poor repair, and not many engineers even wanted to walk up the stairs. They'd come in and look at it. It was kind of leaking water from the roof. Uh, they're, they're, the first thing they would say is, well, you know, wood has a use-by date. I mean, can you imagine wood has a use-by date? I mean, you guys on this line all know better than that. And so they said, well, it's built during the 40s. It's coming on 80 years. Uh, it's probably just best to take it down. 
Well, you had too much wrapped up in it, as I just said earlier, all these reasons that that wasn't going to happen. To say nothing of the fact it was going to cost $15 million to take it down. So this TAM, Ter the Tillamook Air Museum people, they kind of got together and said, hey, let's get WRD to come in and we'll look at this from a technical point of view and, and, and understand it structurally and understand it from a wood composites and a wood technology point of view. And so that's what we set out to do was to get in there to look at that. That was our purpose, to use visual inspections, to get up and see things up close. That meant rope access, and it meant a big, tall lift. I mean, it took like six weeks to order in the tallest Zoom in America to get up in here. It, it was a story. I, and what equipment were we going to use? Well, you know, stress wave technology we're going to use, cyclometers we're going to use. Of course, increment bores take assay samples and different forms of non-destructive testing. We were going to take this data and understand it. Well, can you imagine the number of elements in this building? There's 586,000 individual timber elements. I'll say that one more time. 586,000 timber elements. So how do you go about doing that with a budget that's affordable? You know, understanding where do you go test the pieces? What sampling rate are you going to use and feel comfortable assessing a uh, buildings integrity and keep your you know because it doesn't flatten out three years from now after we got our seal on so these are important aspects this isn't just a you know a one or two story building where the significance is well the snowfall might have got it it might crop and crippled on one corner you're talking about a huge building with huge implications with a huge amount of people there's 80,000 people a year go through this museum I, it, the implications and the liability are significant and so you just don't wander into it if you don't know about wood, you don't know how to inspect it, and you don't know what tools to use to inspect it. So we sent two teams of people in and used a 10% assay sample. In addition to that, we focused on one particular truss set and did every element as part of not only having a canvas, but also having a, a piece by piece count. And we took samples, we took assay samples, many of them, we took all of these through to compression wave. Uh, assessments. And so as we looked at these bents, people had to decide firstly, what bents will we go look at? How do we know what bent to start looking at? So that involved a inspection around the building to zero in on stuff. And so often today, if you're not educated in, the first thing you look at is for water stain. You look in an old building, the first thing you say, well, look, geez, there's a water stain. Well, what did that mean? I could have had a temporary water stain. That doesn't mean that the, the piece is done. That's just an exterior view. And if you don't use non-destructive testing, the water stain piece could be as good as gold. And quite frankly, in this building, the water stain pieces were the ones that weren't decayed. The ones that weren't water stained, that were hiding bad decay, those are the bad actors you've got to find. Those are the ones that are under the surface that you've got to find. And that's what we set out to do. So uh, in the visual side, the box beam and door systems had ser serious repair requirements, but we could have left uh, that door unopened uh, and get by until the money's available. So that one wasn't as big of a feature for us because they don't have to have the doors open on the end. They'll want them open in the final product, but as you stage in the restoration to, to match the staged in revenue that you're going to get or staged in grants you're going to get to heal it up, you have to kind of put your money where it talks the loudest in the very beginning. Here's the big features of this, the testing side, the summary before I dive into some of the weeds. In the testing side, the SWT results revealed there was minimal decay throughout the building. The previous two engineering analysis that had been completed by general house engineering firms said that decay was rampant through the building. I'll say that again, said that decay was rampant through the building. We found very little evidence. The number of reds and yellows, that's red, is a heavy uh, decay with a high stress wave time over 1,000 microseconds on a uh, 300 millimeter gauge length. And the number of yellows, that's over 800 microseconds on a 300 millimeter gauge length. The total of those two was just under 10%. That's not rampant. There's a whole lot more wood than that that's water stained. And so that's the first big thing that the TAM 
the museum people and the and the owners and the operators, the uh, Tillamook, Port of Tillamook, that's the first thing that they started to think about was, wait now, it's going to cost $17 million to tear it down. We're finding out that less than 10% of the elements are, are needing restoration. And this result is not that we need to tear it down. The opposite is true. And that this building has a really good opportunity to be restored and put back into service. This is big news to them. They were totally amazed by this. And it's a really good statement about wood. And so the other factor was is the amount of lateral cross bracing from a structural point of view. The building was built well and designed well back in the day. Uh, and, and that was another testimony to the structure in terms of its characteristic. So we got in these big zoom booms, very unique zoom booms, and got up in underneath here. You can see one end of it, the door opening is in pretty good shape. On the other end of it, guess what? Not in good shape. And, you know, that's no good. That's letting water in on all the structural elements. They closed off the cupola, as I said, because they, they thought the louvers were getting it. And then, of course, the roof on the top portion there is not proper. It's not been upgraded and it's leaking like a sieve and the water up in that cupola area is really getting on stuff and they have to do something in the near term. And so we said that one of the first mandates is, is to get the roofing done, uh, get up in those in their internal areas in the cupola and make sure that you've, we, we get the rest of those items uh, before we uh, go much further. And so that's the first, well, first out of the gate and to fix some of these door areas you can see here. The inspection photos, the birds get up inside there. So over 80 years, the birds have had their way with most every place in that building. And so uh, grabbing a hold of elements that were horizontal and moving around on them was always a, a surprise. Uh, you can see here, <clears throat> note the moisture and surface fungal growth. The deck, which had been leaking the deck on the elements, tended to have the most fungal growth. Uh, some of the elements that were close to the deck had bits of fungal growth through fruiting bodies that were evident. And most of the time, even when they had evidence of fruiting bodies, there was still some pretty good uh, characteristics around for the elements so that they could be restored. I would point out that we cored the deck to take an outer and inner in the deck to understand the depth of penetration of the moisture. And the deck at the top portions, the hat portions is pretty saturated. Now, why am I saying that? Well, when you get moisture and wood up over 75 or 80%, what happens is the oxygen content drops. And sometimes the, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly is the saying, if you're going to be wet, be really wet because the oxygen content is low enough that it also stops decay. It's these transition zones that get you with wood where you've got enough oxygen and you've got enough moisture. Uh, you see the floor uh, in the north central box beam adjacent. You see kind of the places where water will rest and stay are the places where you're going to get into uh, flooring that's in poor condition and pieces and elements that are in poor condition. This is the north central box beam connection to the east. You can see again where water gets in and rests and stays, particularly toward the end because end grain travel of moisture and wood is 100 times faster than side grain. So if you're into the ends of pieces, it's generally where the moisture will tend to feather into the piece more quickly and more effectively. You see, looking down here from the catwalk, this is not from the top of the building. This is the catwalk here to the right. You can see it. That's the extent of my uh, bravery in this building. Uh, fortunately, I have other guys that are braver than I am. They're able to get up higher than this. As you can see here, one of the other things they're doing, look at the nets they're spreading here. This is that the engineers of record prior to us arriving on the scene said they do that the building was in danger of falling down and elements were going to fall out and hit people. They were walking around the museum underneath, so they had them spread nets. You know, instead of going out and fixing it and finding out what was wrong, they just put nets up to keep the, you know, catching the pieces that were going to fall out, which we found very few elements that were ready to do that. Look at this roof here. You can see the roofing is just completely gone at the top and of course when that gets in there and the cupola is shut down you can see everything's boarded up on the cupola you can see here look it's all boarded up look at both sides and they've just closed it in well and now all of a sudden this big building can't breathe anymore and the moisture is hanging around and you got trouble so uh it shows you more of that evidence here the inspection photos more tension cords 
This is a tension cable for opening up the box. This kind of shows you where the Texas cable is. Completely extended, stuck in position. So if you think you're opening that door, think again. It's not going to happen. That's the big tension cable here, and it's not connected. So these doors uh, really are stuck in place until they get fixed. You can see deck damage portions here. Look on the right-hand side. You'll see the fruiting bodies. That's not precipitate. It might look like precipitate from evaporate. Um, which you often see on timber, uh, particularly at timber and pulp mills and so on, where there's a lot of humidity. But in this particular case, that was, in fact, a fruiting body, uh, as you can see here in different locations. So the deck is going to be one of those things. It's, not, it's a secondary element, as you folks all know. And so the primary elements have to be fixed first to remain, keep the integrity of the building. But that deck uh, can wait because one of the first things that owners want you to do is prioritize repair, replacement, upgrades. And this is kind of what we do is you kind of prioritize based on primary and secondary. So in our particular case, this shows you a, a findings where we code them in color for a through compression wave. And uh, the through compression wave just is really about measuring the first time of flight between the start and the stop, which are uh, two halves of an, excel of a, uh, an accelerometer. And basically, to put it in layman's language, you put a strain gauge on one start at one side. That's the stop. It's a hammer. Put a strain gauge over on the stop. You tap the wood. You don't beat on it. You tap it. That sends a compression wave through the wood. It, it starts a timer timing, and it measures the time of flight of that compression wave to the millionth of a second. And that's directly related to the specific gravity and to the MOE and to the strength. And you have to have it calibrated for different species because it's different for different species and it's different for different grades and it's different for different moisture content. So it's not simple as just taking a mind one of these off the shelf. You have to know a lot more than just that. How to calibrate your readings becomes critical. Uh, you, can, you could buy one and get relative differences between strikes, but you're not going to be able to develop a demand versus resistance and utilization ratio unless you're effectively knowing residual capacities and you've got to do it the right way in order to understand those. So you can see here the number of elements. And what I want you to notice as I flick through these slides, gentlemen and ladies, look, they said that building two times in a row over a five-year period was condemned. We need to take it down. It's a life and limb issue. Now, if you need to take down a building, and I've looked at 50,000 elements in a building, Yes, that's 10% of the total, uh, less than 10%, but that's a pretty good assay sample. Now, you just watch the few times that you see the reds here and the yellows. We were about ready to take a building down, you know, and, and if they'd had the money, it would have been taken down for a few reds and yellows. So... Uh, the report findings focused on, you know, talking about the moisture contents, talking about the core results, uh, our slide work, I gathered all these samples together, as you can see here, with the relative equilibrium moisture content calcs. We got up in close as far as we could. When this thing wouldn't reach, we had to get out and climb. And I'll tell you, that's not a game for the weak of heart. Uh, that's a big boom. As you can see here, taking core samples. So the core samples went back to the lab where we have a microscope connected to the computer that allows us to dissect things and open up and expand and look in and around the cells. And the dead giveaway for this Douglas fir, because we knew it came from Mills in Oregon. It didn't have a large component, which is important. Doug fir is stronger. And as you can see here in this uh, photograph or my microscope photo, all the spiral thickening. That's a dead giveaway for Doug fir. Uh, it was coastal. You can see the border pits that are not aspirated. An interesting little detail in terms of the use of this product to understand that it was Doug fir. You can see more shots here. You can see spiral thickening here all over the place on all these views, which is giving you a good understanding of the, the species type and then its specific gravity and the identification of any uh, fungal decay or, or hyphae growth and basically, in all of our samples uh, that were taken from even the yellows and all the whites, we did not find evidence. It was only in the reds that we found evidence. So, uh, of course, these are the test uh, criteria by which we uh, looked at all these cores, D2395 and 4442, to understand the characteristics. And we pasted this all in overlays 
so that the client could see it in real version with each section of the piece, each section of the building along its length was then pictured and we shoot, showed the bad actors. Now I'm just gonna focus through this because this is kind of rolling up, you're glad to get rid of me, I'm almost done, I assure you, so have a bit of patience yet, I'm almost done. But as I look through this here, I want you to see something very critical. Look for the yellows and reds. There's a yellow at the bottom. Look for the yellows and reds. Yellow in there on a brace. On a deck joist, another one. Look for the yellow, a yellow there. Look at the red here in a lateral. A yellow. A yellow, a yellow, a yellow, a yellow, a yellow, yellow, yellow and a red, laterals, at a joe, at a node, yellow and a reds at nodes, yellow and reds at nodes and laterals, yellow. Yellow and red. Yellow and red again on laterals. You hear what you're saying? See, I'm telling you reds and yellows, most of them on laterals. Not even in the tension and compression cord. Most again on laterals. Laterals. So you can see now how this repair recommendation was going to go. Gee whiz, we had about 10% bad actors. Number two, the vast majority of those bad actors and laterals. Tension cord and compression cord sound, except for some nodes. Top hat, cupola have been closed over, open it up, re-roof the top, get up in that cavity. It's going to take some particular expertise to look at those last elements. Fix the building as it sits. Now, instead of being 17 million to take it down, 3.6 to 3.9 million deals with the exact red, reds and yellows and the bad actors. And so it two, pre two previous reports was take it down and ours was about something else and that's preserve it, extend its life, do the sorts of things that are important to do, stop moisture ingress, provide for proper ventilation, isolate the degraded elements and they'll re get them restored and walls must be considered, but they could be considered at another time and structural analysis of the complete structure to understand the stresses, the demand loads that are on those pieces. The observations included exterior roofing, as I showed you earlier, and the decking, which is gonna to have to have some replacement. That's a, a big thing. Restore the venting. These are all the things I've just talked about. Future of the museum, uh, it's, uh, sorry, of uh, the hangar, and they wanna to continue to operate it as a museum. They wanna keep it and preserve it for downstream use by all parties. And they're committed to doing that now. And so at that point, I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm sorry for taking me a little long, but I did want to get a front end that would kind of set the basis for how we look at these uh, buildings. I'm open to questions, Doug.